Hi, I'm James Egidio, your host of the 99 Relapses podcast, the podcast that moves you from recovery to discovery through the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In episodes number 24 and 25 of the 99 Relapses podcast, I mentioned that for anyone that who has ever experienced an out-of-control addiction knows that change can often be difficult, especially when you try to do it on your own. I also mentioned that recovery from addiction comes from or comes when the pain of the addictive behavior becomes greater than the pain of giving up the behavior. This is known as hitting rock bottom. The bad news is that hitting rock bottom can and often leads to jail or death. The good news is that if you survive rock bottom with an addiction, that is where grace is found. My guest knows where rock bottom is and has humbled himself and knows that his peace and salvation comes from the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is my pleasure and it is a blessing to introduce my guest, Mr. Jonathan York. Thanks, Jonathan. Hey, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell uh, the listening audience a little bit about, um, of the 99 Relapses podcast, a little bit about your story and what led to your, you know, your addiction and um, your uh, moment of accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay. All right. Well, it kind of has to start um, with with the story I was born into, which is, uh, um, you know, my mom, 16, dad, 17, no real uh, support from their parents. Um, my earliest memory is, is one of my mom laying on a mattress all day um, while I was hungry trying to figure out how to open a can of potato soup and through stories or through a conversation with my aunt we we figured that's right around three two to three years old based on the this description of the apartment and things like that um so my mom was an addict since birth um on the other side my, my dad and, and them have struggled with alcoholism uh so drugs alcohol have been around me my whole life um, non-stop from that to growing up in kind of a um, poor area in South Atlanta. So you mix in the uh, the street drugs and the drug dealers and and that whole lifestyle. And, and the, those are the people that we looked up to because, you know, they had the money and the girls and the cars and all those things. So drugs have been, you know, prevalent in my life um, pretty much since birth. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I got married when I was 20 and had my first daughter and had a son through my 20s is when addiction really started to come out of me. Um, pathological liar, double life, um, foreclosure, just really bad human being. Um, around 30, my, my wife finally had enough of it and uh, got a divorce. When that happened, uh, I went even harder for a couple of years um, to the point to, I mean, all the way to needles, um, the whole nine yards, uh, to the point where it landed me in prison for three years. So after my awakening from, I don't know, probably two to three weeks of sleeping um, because I've been running so hard, um, I think I was clear headed for the first time in, I don't know, 20 years, 30, I mean, a long time. Um, I'd Because I'd started smoking weed when I was like 12 years old or something like that. So this is 20 straight years of, of drug use. Um, I waken out of that haze and, and I, I immediately, um, there's some stories I could tell about looking around and just kind of knowing that this is not the life or where I wanted to be. Um, but I, uh, I was fortunate enough to have met someone in jail before I went to prison as I was waiting trial and all that, um, who kind of put me on the path and I dove into the word and I, I, uh, I really started building a foundation pretty early on. I mean, it was, you know, just like anyone it's a gradual thing um but i definitely had some moments um as early as that where sunlight coming through listening to you know christian music on the radio and just kind of feel something not really understanding uh, exactly what it was so fast forward I, I i work or i get out of prison um and within about a month my mom overdoses and is, is in icu um, five days of eyes rolled back in her head, the mouth hanging open, kind of like mm. what you would imagine, like a, a, a severe stroke victim would kind of look like. 
Right. Um, there were some conversations uh, being had, you know, decisions needing to be made. And I had missed so much time with my mom through prison and everything that I had done. I, I feel like I prayed her through that. Um, I just didn't want that to be it. So she wakes up um, and kind of get her separated from my sister and her boyfriend because uh, when they were around in the new mix, my mom and her substance abuse, it was just extra toxic. Um, so I get her in a separate apartment and my sister calls one day asking if her and her boyfriend could come stay there. And luckily I'm there and I, I get my mom to stand strong. And I'm like, mom, you just got to see yourself. You know, you can barely take care of yourself. This, you, this is not what you can do right now. So I feel really good about it. But about a month goes by and I get a phone call from my aunt that my sister had um, overdosed in some crappy motel room in Atlanta. Oh, wow. So mm. I'm carrying the weight of of losing my sister, but also the guilt of should I have let her come home? If I ought to let her come home or, you know, come to mom's that day, maybe this wouldn't have happened. So I say that's the worst day of my life as I'm driving. I have to drive about 30 minutes to tell my mom this, who is so fragile herself. Uh, as you can imagine, it was, um, it was a really rough, rough day, rough morning. Sure. Um, we get, we get through my sister's uh, funeral and everything. And, and, um, I get my mom living within about five miles of my work. So I'm checking on her daily, um, at my lunch breaks and things like that. Um, between the years of substance abuse and drinking, and, and I think she already suffered for some, she definitely suffered for some mental health stuff. On top of that, uh, it got to the point where she was just having these vile, almost like evil conversations with no one. And I would sit on the outside of her apartment, like on her steps and just listen to her scream and just have these crazy conversations. Um, you know, I guess dealing with the loss of, of her daughter and, and everything combined. So um, fast forward about three or four months of this and, and I go to check on her on my lunch break one day and I find her uh, suicide by overdose. Um, on my lunch break. When I found my mom um, and I called 911, I grabbed a hand, or, um, three, exactly, three of her Percocets that were laid on the floor and threw them, threw them in my mouth. And so from that point, I had not done any drugs since before prison or before jail. Yeah. How, um, how old were you so at I, the time when this was all going on? Uh, I got out of Prison at thirty four or so, okay. right around thirty, like uh, about eight years ago. Okay. Um, so I relapsed then for uh, two months or so, uh, but for the first time in my life, I, and let me back up a little bit. I, sure. When I was getting towards the end of the prison, I was in a transitional center, and I had an aunt and uncle who came and got me every because you got to leave on one day a week. Um, so they would come get me every Sunday and take me to church and take me back to their house and just really pour into me. So, um, you know, when I got out of prison through all that, like I was to the point where I was, you know, praising openly in church, you know what I mean? I had built a solid, sure. solid foundation of faith. Um, I went to several, um, you know, prison services and things like that through the past four years. So I had built a, a I didn't have a personal relationship with Christ at this point, but I had built a, a pretty good foundation. Um, I say all that to say, um, you know, after mom and the relapse, uh, I said, God gave me the strength to handle the situation like a man, probably for the first time. And I called my wife and I uh, said, you know, babe, when this happened with mom, this happened and this is what I've been dealing with and lay it all out there, um, which I'd never done before. You know, you know, typically in that, you're hiding things and this and that, and you're right. going to be the last person to just bring stuff out to light. So. I knew something in, in me had changed just by, by that, you know, just, just the way I handled it. So, um, I mean, when we sat down on the couch, we had just visited a church. Um, it was a pre-launch, hadn't even had its first service yet, um, but the pastor was a normal guy. And I felt connected to the church and the people for the first time in my life. I'd never really had a church home. Um, that church really helped bring me uh, through that time. Um, and that was like, 2018 mm -hmm. is when I relapsed. 
Um, so it's been almost five years now clean. And um, man, I would say about two years ago, I went, you know, my wife had this, this little struggle and, and some things were said that kind of rocked me to my core and ter- ter- really ch- turned me inward. And, and I kind of did the deep dive. And, and that's when everything really changes about two years ago um, through that process. And, and man, I, I don't know how to really explain it, but God just he put it on my heart that uh, it has all been for a reason. You know, I kind of carried, you know, the victim mentality. Why me? Why this happened to me? Life's right. not fair for, right. for a long time. And, uh, you know, he put it on my heart that it's all been for a reason, you know, that I put you through it because you can handle it. And I put you through it because, like, I need you strong for what's coming. And right. and when he put that on my heart, man, everything changed. Um so now I say all that to say now I have like a personal relationship with Christ. Like we talk on a daily basis and, and right. um, yeah, man, I'm in, I'm in a good place now, but it's been a, it's been a tough road. So you mentioned something about that turning point and that was like you said, five, what, five years ago, right? Mm-hmm. What, 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 what was the, what was the catalyst for that change? Like what, what, said okay this You're is talking about the real internal change yes exactly so that was two about two years ago <clears throat> two years ago okay we had yeah 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 we went me and my wife went through a rough patch a, a rough time we just had this deep conversation and, and some things were said that just kind of rocked me to my core and right. um and and then i went on a work trip for about 30 days or so and just pretty much me in a hotel room and i just did this deep dive internal deep dive and, and asking started asking why am i this and why I'm, i mean just really started looking at my life and i right. haven't stopped and it's been about i say it's been a 10-year process from the time i was arrested to get me to this point um, right. just getting a little bit better and a little bit better each day uh, but i'm sure. really realizing that the real work is is really just kind of beginning um, right so yeah yeah that's awesome that's beautiful um you know, you mentioned a few of the elements of addiction in your, in your, and when you bared your testimony, and I, I mentioned this a lot in the 99 Relapses podcast, and one of them, of course, of, is always shame and guilt. You know, we always want to hide our, our addictions, and um, there's a lot of, I know, t- uh, the other one is uh, taking responsibility for our addictions, too, and I, I talk about that a lot as well in the 99 Relapses podcast is, we have to take responsibility for our addictions because we're all addicted, every single one of us. And, you know, it's always the drugs and alcohol that are in the forefront of addiction because that's the most prevalent and most obvious addiction. But every single one of us is addicted to something. Like I said, it's either, you know, it, aside from drugs and alcohol, it could be, it could be work work is addicting, Mm -hmm. money's addicting. These are all things that we covet, uh, social media, um, uh, obsessive uh, compulsive thinking is, is, is an addiction, uh, foods an addiction. There's all kinds of addictions in there and it's all part of our sin nature. And I did a two part segment early on when I launched the 99 relapses podcast and it, and it was titled as addiction sin. And what I did is I basically just simply outlined all these things that's that addictions lead to and it's you know i mean you you've been in the in the system it's it's uh selfish uh you know i mean there's just it goes on and on and on so what does that mean well it means as christians we take responsibility for it um but we also acknowledge it as sin and of course that means repentance right so yeah it's important i think for for anyone who out there who's listening and who is addicted, um, that um, you know this not only affects you as a as a person, and yeah, I'm not saying it also affects other people around you, but we also have to acknowledge what this what what addiction truly is, and it's it's a very selfish act too, and I I think you. You can relate to that because I I know I can personally yeah. as well. When I was addicted to drugs and and alcohol and and just doing my thing, uh, I didn't care about anybody else around me. And you never do because you'll use 
and you'll, I, I overdosed and I went right back out two weeks later, a week later, not even two weeks later, a week later. So, you know, we have to acknowledge that as Christians, that it, that's what it is. It's, it's sin. But um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting story. So what, what you, you have a, a ministry now or what, what's with your, your, I, mean, uh, I don't know if you could refer to it as a ministry, but we have the resilient man project and, and it's, uh, yeah, that's, I was going to ask you that. Yeah. When, when I started it, it was, uh, I kind of made the commitment and, and I, I feel like that I've been led, led here. I'm sure as you do. Um, mm -hmm. and I was trying to reach, you know, former versions of myself. And, and the last thing that a former version of myself is really wants is someone to, to, let's just say preach at them. So the, the, I would, you know, I went into it with, I want, I'm going to, I'm going to share my testimony. I'm going to share my story. Sure. And I'm going to just point, I'm going to point to Jesus the whole time. You know, this is what, right. but then it quickly, uh, you know, turned to Jesus in the forefront and it has been, uh, he had a different plan. I think I misunderstood his directions or something because it's been, uh, you know, I've, I basically, this is in a nutshell, it's, I feel like that if you can, we're all stronger than we think we are. And, mm -hmm. and there's all these moments in our life where we don't know if we're going to, you know, we just feel like we're never going to make it to the other side. And then we kind of make it to the other side. I just like to say we build up that resilience muscle, you know, through our life's experiences. But then if you can, if you can take that and multiply it by what I call spiritual resilience, which is a fancy way of saying a, a personal relationship with Christ. If you can kind of combine those two, uh, man, you become an unstoppable force, you know, to the point sure. to where, you know, there's, there's nothing. I say there's nothing. There's one thing I'm afraid of. Every parent's afraid of one thing, but there's really nothing. I know I can get through anything at this point. And that's a freeing feeling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, too, when we go through this process of overcoming these addictions um, and we look at some unresolved issues that may have caused them, because I think a lot of times, too, um, addiction is a rebellious act. Um, a lot of times it's an act of, OK, I'm going to punish that person, at, you know, of that unfinished business. So. I know for me personally, it was, you know, the unforgiveness of my father for years and I'm punishing myself and not forgiving him for the way he, you know, what, what I was subjected to with my father, which led, and I don't want to blame anybody for my addiction in the past, but once you resolve that, you know, and you, you go through that process of forgiveness and you, you, you get over that, um, getting through that also requires to 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 provide that forgiveness or to give that forgiveness is shedding the uh, pride and the ego so of course as you know i'm sure you experience this it's it's a humbling experience is when you we come to christ we come to christ on our knees and it's a very humbling experience um and that we have to we have to we can't forget we can't forget that you know what i mean we can't forget to, to keep ourselves humble, no matter. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because, um, you know, that's where the, the grace is, is in that, you know? Yeah, and, and speaking on, you know, forgiveness and uh, the way I, I like to say it is, you know, I, I view my, I'm sure that when you hear my story in, in detail and a little bit, you know, you would, you would look at my mom's life a, a certain way because let's, if I'm going to be honest, she just, she wasn't a, a very good mom at all. And, and she wasn't right. really a good person. Um, and, and I'm sure when you hear my story, you know, people would view her life as, you know, a certain way as anyone would, but through these changes over the last couple of years, um, you know, I started to see it in a whole different light. Um, I, I view my mom's life as, as almost beautiful now, because like, I know that it took that, to get me here and it's almost right. like sacrificial to me mm -hmm. you know like she sacrificed mm -hmm. her life to make this man you see before you right and uh man that was a, that was another powerful you know revelation that, that i've had over the last year or so sure sure i know we learn from our experiences isn't it amazing we have to go through what we have to go through but you know that's that 
that was the plan. And, and again, like you said, that's what got us where we're at today in terms of our recovery is that um, we had to go through that. You know, some people, like I mentioned at the opening of this is if you survive that, you know, there's grace on the other side and there's mercy on the other side and there's hope. There's a lot of hope. And I always said, there's too, strength. There's a lot yeah, of strength. Yeah, absolutely, Jonathan. And the other thing, too, is that that's where the true freedom is, is in Christ. And we don't, you know, I grew up Catholic, so I, you know, you talked about the relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ as a Catholic. It was, you know, it was candles and, you know, saints and stained glass and all this wonderful symbolism and stuff. But it's not till I got saved 12 years ago, or I'm sorry, 10 years ago, that I realized what a true relationship with Jesus Christ is. And I mean, it's just, he he's the same yesterday, your world. today. Yeah, it rocks your world. And it's the true freedom. And a lot of people... It is. Yeah, and I, 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 I pray for the people out there that haven't really received it yet. And, I'm, you know, you pray and hope that they do before they take their last breath. But, you know, and I always thought true freedom was being rebellious and just doing what I wanted to do. No, I was I was in chains, man. I was in chains. Yeah. You know, I wasn't free. I was far from free. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, yeah, I, the, you know, I walked through, I don't know, let's just say seven years of, you know, kind of like if somebody would say, are you a Christian? I would say, yeah. I mean, you know, I went to church, uh, you know, all those things. Um, but when you, you know, my logical mind always got in the way of just like truly giving myself all the way to him. Um, and, and, and I just had this, you know, I'm a very logical, analytical type of brain. Um, and I, I had this thought, somebody was reading Genesis one day and I was like, or in, in the first paragraph, you know, he creates you know, time, space, and matter, you know, he creates logic in the first paragraph of the Bible. Right. So it's like, it's like light bulb, like, oh man, he's, he's up here. Like he's outside of anything that I can. And, and once you kind of, I don't know, it's a, it's a, it was, it was a pretty cool experience. And, and like I said to the, you know, and like now, like I have such conviction um, and, and, and when you have that feeling inside, like I went on my podcast and I was like, all I want to just say is like, I just want to look at like past versions and then just be like, he's real. Like, this is a real, it's, this, he's real. He's like, this is a real thing. That's all I kept saying. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. And again, um, where, where can uh, the listeners and viewers of the 99 Relapses podcast find you? Uh, all social, Resilient Man Project. Um, and then. Uh, all major platforms, um, Resilient Man Project, YouTube, if you like video, uh, Resilient Man Project everywhere. Like us, yeah. follow us, find us, message, message. It's me on the other end, and I'll message you back. Um, yeah. I've got hundreds of messages from people all over the country and, and you know, some in good places because they made it through, some right in, you know, in, in that bottom you were talking about. And, and one thing that you said earlier, you know, when you opened it about, you know, hitting rock bottom and, and you're right. But, you know, the beautiful thing about it is, is that rock, you know, that rocks Jesus. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You want to explain a little bit to, uh, to the listening and viewers of uh, what the Resilient Man Project is about? Sure. Um, the, the idea is just that uh, I feel like that uh, men have trouble being vulnerable. Um, I feel like that there's a, uh, you know, kind of a stigma placed on, on what addiction and, and, and what a man is supposed to, to, to be. So I, um, uh, I went first because I think that, uh, a lot of men are out there just waiting to share their story, but they don't want to go first. So, um, you know, the hope is, is to use my life experiences, what I went through, what I learned from it, um, mm -hmm. to, to hopefully help someone a few steps behind me um, and then bringing on guests um, that are sharing their life's experiences and the things that they went through. Um, sure. 
and, and I've had a man on that lost his wife to suicide. And it's not all about addiction. It's just, just about trials and, and the, the trauma of life and what we learned right. in that trauma. Um, and then so there's somebody out there going through what you've been through right now that could really use some advice and some encouragement. You know, so that's kind of the premise behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really appreciate your time on the 99 Relapses podcast. For It was awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right.